Hey, what's going on guys? So when animals are on the brink of extinction, how do we begin the task of saving them? So I'm here in my home state of Minnesota, about an hour drive north of Minneapolis, and I'm about to take a tour of the Wildlife Science Center. And the work that these dedicated individuals are doing here at the center is literally saving these wolves from extinction, namely the red wolf. So I'm gonna take you guys on a tour of the Wildlife Science Center here in Minnesota, and we're gonna meet some of these incredible wolves that are right now on the brink of extinction. All right, so this is Bob Ebsen. Uh, what is your job here at the uh, Wildlife Science Center? I'm the Education Director at the Wildlife Science Center, and I've been here since 2001. Um, titles at the Wildlife Science Center don't really mean that much. Sure. Everybody's got to be willing to pitch in and do everything. So if cages need cleaning, if watering, if somebody's got to move snow, and if everything's got to get done by everybody because we're a very small nonprofit. So there's a small staff that gets paid to be here every day. There are also volunteers and interns that do a bulk, a lot of work. We wouldn't be open, and that is also a source of funding in a way. Mm -hmm. We're not spending money on salaries to keep the place going. All right, so this is Rachel and Sam. You are two of the uh, paid staff that are here, and your job is to kind of ride around on the cart and feed. <laughs> what are we feeding here? Looks like a deer leg. Yep, deer leg, fresh red killed deer donated by the county. So if somebody hits a deer, they call you? Yeah, or the county will go. They kind of run around on their trucks and pick everything up and then drop it off with us. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep. All right, so we're going to feed the red wolves? Yes, we are. Let's do it. So red wolves are a critically endangered species, and I will go with species, it's just sort of not contrary to the study, but I believe, and I think most researchers believe that they are separate species. They are a southeastern United States wolf. The last wild population was found in Texas. At that time, there were 12 left on the planet Jeez. in the 1970s. Obviously, steps were taken to try to increase the numbers. Um, you partner up strong males to strong females, the, ge the genetically one, the ones that are the right pair together. Hope for puppies. If they have puppies, for a while they were releasing puppies back into the wild. Mm. Right now that's not possible based yep. on federal law, but they are what they are. So there's now, I'm gonna say 200 or so in captive in wild captive populations. I believe the wild population, I'm gonna say is under 40. Yeah. And I would have to go look to find current numbers to find out exactly what those are. But it, it, if I've been telling people for the last year or so, it's about 200 in, in, in captivity, about 40 in the wild. The wild ones are not doing well because the protection's not there anymore. So how many red wolves do you have here? We have four, there's two in this enclosure. Wow, they really wolf their food, don't they? <laughs> the nonprofit originally was called the Wolf Project, and it was a federal funded project to study wolves, to learn more about wolves. The funding ran out in 1991. Um, in 1991, they were going to shut the facility down, euthanize all the animals. Um, Peggy Callahan and Mark Beckel found a way to keep the center going, opened up again as a nonprofit in 1994, and it became the Wildlife Science Center. They were going to shut it down and euthanize all the wolves. Correct. How many wolves are under the care here? Um, over a hundred. Over a hundred wolves? Over a hundred and they're here for all kinds of different reasons. Um, different animals are here for different reasons. None of them are releasable. There's a couple here that if they had puppies they may be releasable, the critically endangered ones. Sure. Most of the things that come here are here for the rest of their lives. So if there's another option for them, take them somewhere else. But for the reality with these guys, they will be here as some education animals at the Wildlife Science Center for the rest of their lives. So this is a group that was born, I'm gonna say two and a half years ago. Um, it's males and females mixed together. It is a pack. There are dominant animals in there. There are less dominant animals in there. They've never had puppies. They're I, we're, I don't know if we're ever going to let them have puppies. The reality is it's a group that we bottle fed that ended up being together and today they're together. In the future they may not be. Mm. And what happens when you separate a pack like that that grew up together? Well, it would be it, based on necessity. If there's something happens in there and they're suddenly not getting along or one is getting picked on, we have to be able to make changes to make the pack stable, make it better living together. You can't just put animals together and say get along. Yeah, sure. Nothing gets along if you have more than one. It doesn't work all the time. so. Um, so there, today it works. It's been working since they were born. I hope it keeps working into the future, but there will come a day when we probably have to do some splitting. Some of the animals in this enclosure were born in British Columbia, Canada. Gotcha. In British Columbia, there's an endangered species that the wolves are using for a food source. So the biologists up there are trying to figure out how do you save the caribou? How do you keep the caribou numbers at a, a, a good number sure. for viability, genetic, all the stuff that goes on with animals out there. 
they asked us to take some wolf puppies years ago, probably 10 years ago and also eight years ago. And they came here because of endangered species issues. All right, so moving on, I see uh, you also have the black wolves. <laughs> <laughs> yep, very large black wolves. Um, we have black bears. Um, the black bears that come here come for lots of different reasons. So there's one in here that was born in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Mom and cub were crossing a highway and mom got hit by a car. Oh no. Mom's not alive out in the wild. The cub is too small to take care of itself. So the um, the people that were dealing with the cub in that, that day, that week, they looked for a rehabber that was able to take the cub, but they couldn't find one licensed rehabber that could take it when they needed it to. So we were the next option. Bring it to the Wildlife Science Center, let it live here for the rest of its life. Um, he's been here since he was a tiny basketball sized cub. Um, he now weighs, I'm going to estimate him, between 450 and 500 pounds. Wow. Um, he is an adult now, um, and they are bears, the big omnivores that live at the Wildlife Science Center. That's fantastic. So you don't just provide homes for wolves. Nope. You provide homes for a lot of wildlife. You know, here's two cougars over here. You've got foxes over there, bobcats over here. So the Wildlife Science Center, we've had many people ask us to change our name. Um, funders and things, not funders, people that are supposed to go looking for funds. They want to change it to something like the Minnesota Wolf Center or something like that. But sure. we're not just wolves. We have other animals and we have them because of educational opportunities. These two cats in this enclosure, mountain lions, pumas, cougars, whatever name you want to call them, they came because they needed a home to come to. They were in Indiana in a roadside attraction and not well cared for and they ended up coming to us. We use them for education, and I do think that there are lots of people, many people in where they live that don't know necessarily the animals that live near them. Sure. So Minnesota animals are here. We can talk about the stuff that we have here to be able to show people this animal lives maybe not in your backyard, but not that far away. Sure. They're here, and people can come see them, learn about them. They come right up to the fence. They're easy to see. You can see everything about them. You can see the muscle tone on them, which is my favorite thing. Yep. You can even hear one of them purring which is an amazing thing to have something that close and have that interaction with something that you never get to see. Absolutely, because you could live your entire life and never get to see that in the wild. <laughs> Listen to her purr. Yep. <laughs> and the other noises. Yeah. <laughs> So where did these uh, coyotes come from? She is really She friendly. came from a zoo that ran out of funding and we ended up taking her. The male coyote that's out moving around on the other side of this enclosure came from northern Minnesota. He was orphaned in the wild. Mm. And he came here as a very small little pup. Um, they have been together, but we decided to give them a little more time in separate enclosures, interacting through a barrier to make sure it's going to go well before we put them back together. Gotcha. So is it coyote or coyote? I believe it's interchangeable, and I believe you probably use the designation that you heard when you were a kid. Right. If grandma called it a coyote, you probably call it a coyote. It right. could be coyote. They're also called brush wolves right. by some people. Um, not technically a wolf, it's a coyote. I also use both, and I use them interchangeably. And so do I. Yep, it's kind of tomato, tomato, yep. but nobody really ever says tomato. Correct. I just kind of use Wiley E for these guys. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yeah. and uh, no roadrunners in Minnesota. That's right. If you guys weren't here, these animals would not have a home. Well, they wouldn't. They may have found a different place to live, but I, we get phone calls about things we can't take or can't take that day. Um, we try to say yes to most things, um, but. The reality is these animals have a home where they're cared for. They get water, they get food, they get the medical attention that they need. Um, some of the animals, like the, most of this row, they were pets before we got them. And I don't believe there would have been any place for them. They couldn't get released in the wild. Sure. I don't know if another facility was able to take them. We ended up with them, and they're great to have here to show people more about Minnesota wildlife. So now, how does, uh, how does somebody make a donation? That um, you can go on our website, wildlifesciencecenter.org. There's ways to do it there. Um, you could also, if you wanted to do it a different way, contact the center, call us, email us. We'll figure out a way to make it most comfortable for the way you want to donate. Fantastic. So guys, I'm gonna put all the links to the Wildlife Science Center in the description below. Go check them out and consider a donation. It's because of the good work that these people do that literally are saving these animals from extinction in the wild. And be sure to give this video a like and hit that subscribe button. And when you do, hit that bell so you never miss an upload. And until the next animal adventure, love the planet and rattle on. <laughs>